noche te persigue, entrégate a ella o oh, dile que tienes dolor de cabeza, sobrita de rep... Hi guys, my name is Nako Nakatsuka. I'm a fourth year chemistry PhD student at UCLA. And today I'll be helping you guys out by going over some general chemistry concepts. And good luck with the course. So we talked about the de Broglie wave equation and the Heisenberg's indeterminacy equation. And now we have to talk about the final fundamental equation in quantum mechanics, which is Schrodinger's wave function equation. So when we talk about Schrodinger's wave function, it plays the role of Newton's law and conservation of energy in classical mechanics. Basically, it predicts the future behavior of a dynamic system. It's a wave equation in terms of a wave function, which is given this sign, psi, which predicts analytically and precisely the probability of events or an outcome. The detailed outcome is not strictly determined, but given a large number of events, the Schrodinger equation will predict the distribution of results. And so basically we're using this wave function right here to describe an electron in an atom. So since an electron has wave-like properties and an indeterminacy momentum and position, which we talked about in the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, we can describe it with this guy. And this is the Greek letter psi, and it basically gives the wave function as x, y, and z coordinates. And this represents the height of a wave at position x, y, and z. But it's psi squared over here that represents the probability of finding an electron. So if you look at this, basically when it's positive or negative, this node is the only point at which the probability of finding an electron is practically zero. And that's why in the probability distribution, you have two peaks, because in this case, it doesn't matter whether it's in the positive or negative, as long as you can find an electron here and here. So the wave function, like an electromagnetic wave, can take positive or negative values and use a sine or cosine function. Schrodinger's equation states that operating a change on this wave function results in energy. And so this is going to be an equation that you'll see quite often. But don't worry, in this class you won't have to solve anything involving it. So just be familiar with seeing it. So when you first look at it, you're like, oh, I have no idea what any of these things are. Well, this is called the Hamiltonian. And it's something that operates on this wave function in order to get energy. And this ends up being the energy of an electron. And basically, this wave function satisfies an equation called an orbital. So there's many solutions to this equation, and therefore there's many orbitals. And now we're going to talk a little bit about atomic orbitals and introduce you to that concept. So now we move on to talk about atomic orbitals, S, P, D, and F. So previously we mentioned the Schrodinger wave function, and an atomic orbital is a mathematical function that describes the wave-like behavior of either one electron or a pair of electrons in an atom. And so basically we're now showing the electron probability distribution in terms of these colored regions. This function can be used to calculate the probability of finding an electron of an atom in any specific region around the atom's nucleus. And atomic orbitals may also refer to the physical region or space where the electron can be calculated to be present. So basically, the psi squared that we talked about before calculates the probability of finding an electron. And this is shown in this graphical form. And so I drew this arrow here for you to show that the higher energy orbitals are the ones that are larger. 
And so we start out with the smaller s orbitals and move on to f orbitals, which, which are the highest energy orbitals. So there's four main types, s, p, d, and f. And so we'll start out by talking about the s orbital. And it's a spherical shape. Basically, there's a spherical electron distribution around the central nucleus, and so there's no nodal planes. There's a symmetric electron distribution, and like we talked about before in the 1D sense, if there's a node, like so, it means that there's zero probability of finding an electron there. But for an s orbital, that does not exist. So now looking at p orbitals, there's two lobes on either side of the nucleus. And so at the nucleus, there's a nodal plane with a zero probability of electron density. So right here for the px, so px is on the x-axis, pz is on the z-axis, and py is on the y-axis, and each of these have nodes in the middle. So moving on to d orbitals, now we have five different configurations that it can have. It has four lobes of electron probability located in the xz, yz, zx planes, and it also has an electron probability located along the x and y axis, d, dx squared, y squared, as well as dz squared. So let me write that down for you. So we have dxy, dyz, dcx as well as dx squared minus y squared, and finally dz squared. So now moving on to the f orbitals, you have way more different combinations here, and they have much more complicated shapes. So in this course in 14a, we don't really talk about the f orbitals. They're very complicated. So at this moment in time, Let's look at the s, p, and d orbitals and familiarize ourselves with how they look and that the only the p and d orbitals have nodal planes with zero electron probability and s orbitals have a spherical symmetric distribution of electrons around the nucleus.